Welcome to the third of a series of Foibles, Fables, and Fact, Philippine Church History from a Journalist Perspective. Today's topic is Church of God and Men. In 2021, the Philippines celebrates the 500th year of Christianity in the country. But the history of the Catholic Church in the Philippines is fraught with fables and foibles of its protagonists. As a journalist, I wanted, for my own education, to separate fiction from facts. And urged by friends, decided to share what I have studied with all of you. Um, in the slide below, you will find the logo or the official logo for the 500th anniversary. This is based on the painting of national artist Fernando Amorsolo of the first um, mass um, or the, what is known as the first mass on the Philippine Islands. Just a review, the first missionaries of the Philippines came in this order. The Augustinians in 1565, together with the expedition of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, followed by the Franciscans in 1578, the Jesuits in 1581, the Dominicans in 1587, and the Recollects in 1606. If we were to divide the early period of the Philippine church history, it would look like this. 1570 to 1650, the period of the first evangelization. 1650 to 1700s, maturing of the church. 1700s to 1768, the full blossoming of the church. And 1768 to 1898, conflicts between authorities in the church and even among themselves. In 1570, the encomienda was introduced in the Philippines when Legazpi, in compliance with the decree issued by King Philip II in 1558, distributed lands in Cebu to loyal Spanish subjects. These men had helped conquer the Philippines. The encomienda was not actually a land grant, but was a favor which the Spaniard, receiving his favor, was given the right to co collect tributes or taxes from the inhabitants of the area assigned to him. The man who received this favor was called an encomendero. The encomienda was, therefore, a public office. The encomenderos were required by law to perform the following duties. First, to protect the natives. Second, to help the missionaries convert the natives to Christianity. And third, to promote education. Unfortunately, many Spanish encomenderos committed abuses such as the brutal treatment of the Filipinos, collecting more tribute than authorized by law, forcing the people to work for them, and seizure of the people's animals and crops without just compensation. Because of this, peace and order, which the colonizers and the early Spanish friars had established, was disturbed. The abuses led to a conflict between the friars and the encomenderos. The early friars observed that the encomenderos neglected their duty of teaching the Christian faith to the Filipinos. They saw that en the encomenderos were only interested in enriching themselves. Learning from the experience of the Spanish conquest in Latin America, the friars tried to protect the Filipinos from the greed and abuses of the encomenderos by first preaching from the pulpits against encomendero abuses, second writing letters to the king of Spain in which they reported these abuses, and third by refusing to absolve the encomenderos from their sins. In fact, Fray Martin de Rada, the Augustinian principal who had accompanied Legazpi, in a frank letter to the Viceroy of Mexico, concluded that the Spanish rule over the Philippines was illegitimate. Friars called out encomenderos who were abusive and refused to give them absolution. Filipinos appealed to the authority of the bishop to alleviate their woes. 
the first bishop of the Philippines is Bishop Domingo de Salazar, whose reign was not a smooth one. His friction with the governor general, his disagreements with the other religious orders, and at times the disapproval of King Philip II definitely gave him headaches. He also lamented the lack of qualified missionaries in the country to help support his efforts. His single-minded pursuit of clean governance made met with a lot of resistance from Spanish authorities. Who was Domingo de Salazar? He was born in 1512 in a small town of Rioja Alvesa in the northern central Spain. He studied at the University of Salamanca, where he was greatly influenced by Bartolomé de las Casas, the protector of the natives of America and the father of the New World. Salazar was later called the Las Casas of the Philippines due to his fighting spirit and defense of the Filipino natives against the abuses and injustices of the royal Spanish officials and the Filipino datus. In 1582, he called for a synod in Manila. The synod was the assembly of the bishop and his advisors, composed of both religious and diocesan clergy, along with the competent laymen who were invited as resource persons on the rights and duties of everyone in the colony and the abuses thereof. Its purpose was to discuss the good order and system to be followed in the administration of this new church so that she may march forward. Key points for discussion in the Synod were the need for reforms, especially in the way the Spanish colonizers treated the Filipinos and the way the religious members conducted their affairs, matters concerning how Spaniards should conduct themselves, what their role should be, as well as how to correct the mistakes committed by the Spaniards. Because the church was new and governed new Christians, the pronouncements looked more like a set of prohibitions. It is based on the Patronato Real, which the Holy See had given the Spanish king the right and duty to preach the gospel in the newly discovered lands. By itself, this Patronato Real did not give any temporal authority to the king, but to send men to preach the gospel. The king only had a supernatural sovereignty. In the mind of the synod, the soldiers' role only to protect the missionaries and occupy the land, but this higher authorization did not entitle the Spaniards to deprive the natives of their natural right to their individual property or to their dependents, since the gospel, says the summary, disposes no one of what is his. The synod pointed out that Francisco de Sande, waged an unjust war against the Muslim Sultan of Brunei in 1578. They also called out Governor General Gonzalo Ronquillo de Peñalosa that he should stop appointing unfit alcaldes who were abusive to the Filipinos. The handbook of the Manila Synod had, said, had recorded Governors are culpable for their failure to punish those who did injustice. If he failed to do so, if he favored his friends and cronies unjustly over others, if he did not see to it when injustices were brought to his attention that they received due punishment, then he himself as well as the perpetrators were responsible before God for such crimes committed and he was obliged to make restitution himself for the victims of those injustices. The Synod also concluded that forced labor cannot be justified, and specifically they were referring to the practice of making Filipinos rowers of the galleons, and they prohibited slavery and instead proposed that workers should be paid. Other decisions included that each encomienda must have a church of its own 
and a house for the minister. Also to respect the culture of the natives. Ministers should learn the local language and teach in this language, and no one should be forced to accept the faith. At the same time, it is the right of the clergy to call out abuses against justice, the common good, especially of the poor. We see here some of the early doctrinal texts that were written in the local languages. After the Synod, violations of justice did not cease with the proclamation of the decrees of the Synod, which was undertaken in a series of sermons in the cathedral. Many of the conquistadores stopped going to church and receiving the sacraments, since they knew that their sins would not be absolved. The bishop also received death threats. Quarrels continued over the amount of tribute that the Spanish officials were collecting. And so the bishop kept on writing to the king to report these abuses. The church could not always prevent abuse, but it could have been worse if not for the clergy's intervention. What of the friars in the Philippines? This is a topic that needs more discussion and we will take it up in the fourth of the series. In the meantime, I want to share a few things. First, is that friars were primarily responsible for setting up the education system, beginning with schools in Cebu in 1560. By 1863, there was a modern public school system with one school per 153 students. Note that the U.S. school system had one school per 265 students. By the 1700s, all Filipinos knew how to read and write. What is the fake news here? This part of history was muddled by the Americans who claimed to set up the school system in the country. Actually, they found that a school system was already set up and simply replaced it from teaching Spanish to teaching English. If you read the biographies of the national heroes, you will find that most of them had a friar mentor who were their first teachers. The Spaniards also established the University of Santo Tomas, which is the oldest university in Asia. It was established through the initiative of Bishop Miguel de Benavides, of the Order of the Preachers, and he was the third Archbishop of Manila. The University of Santo Tomas was founded on April 28, 1611, with the original campus located in Intramuros, the walled city of Manila. We see the picture of the destruction of the original UST after the bombing of Manila. Harvard, the oldest university in the U.S., was established in 1636. What were the problems in the later years and the points of contention? First, there was no separ because there was no separation of church and state, a lot of the civil duties were given to the friars whether they liked it or not, because of the lack of Spanish officials, especially in many parts of the country far from the capital. This led to a lot of conflict between their roles either as religious leaders or as political leaders. And it sometimes um, led to a lot of misunderstandings and also abuses. Also from the few bad eggs. Some of the friars, of course, this was the 1700s in, the, in Europe, was a time of the Renaissance, which meant that there were some problems within the church and not all admitted to the priesthood were holy men. Unfortunately, these few bad um, friars tainted the good works of the many good friars. Friar lands were also a source of envy. Because of the early um, awarding of lands to the religious orders, there was a problem later on in terms of the shares of 
um, the income and the support of the church, as we shall see later in the next um, ser- in the next part of the series. Friar lands became a bone of contention because the religious orders were running it, and there were some bu- abuses because of the feudal setup in the farm areas. Moreover, diocesan priests had no sources of funds, while the religious had the lands and the harvest as sources of funds to run their schools and churches. In the late 1700s and 1800s, no lo- because the Philippines were no, considered, no longer considered missionary lands, Spain had stopped funding the local church, forcing friars to ask the flock to contribute to their parishes. Diocesan priests started to ask for doni- donations or tithes to run the churches, and people were offended because before, the services given were given freely since they were sponsored by Spain. Propagandists also had to paint friars in a bad light in order to turn the people against them, especially as they had planned or as uh, the conflict with the Spaniards escalated right before the revolution. But this is, again, another topic which is both complex and needs to be taken up um, in greater detail for the next part. And so I end this session here. Some readings that you will find very interesting and they can be downloaded on the internet.